Hello everyone, Michael here. This is part 5 of my Open Lab series. In part 4, we talked about the track model. Today, we're going to talk about straight line simulation in Open Drag. Again, due to updates, I suggest you re-download Open Drag even if you have it. If you don't, go and get it and follow along. So let's start with what Open Drag does. Open Drag simulates a vehicle in a straight line to estimate its performance in acceleration and braking. The way it goes about doing it looks something like this. Let's assume that in time t, a vehicle is at point x with a forward velocity v and in a specific gear. Also, let's say it is trying to accelerate. Because we know everything we need for this vehicle, we can use the drivetrain model to get the engine speed. With the engine speed known, we can use the engine torque curve to get the torque output. Then, using the drivetrain model again, but in the opposite direction, and then the tire model, we get the wheel torque and acceleration tractive forces. Then, using the equations of motion, we can get the state of the vehicle in the next step. The process starts with zero speed and loops through until the maximum speed is reached. When the maximum speed is reached, then it starts braking. Let's think about that now. Again, the state of the vehicle is known. Using the tire model, we get the maximum braking forces. Then, using the equations of motion again, we can calculate the next state. This process goes on from maximum speed to zero. Let's now take a look at Open Drag's solver. It is time based compared to Open Lab's distance solver. Also, in between the time steps, it assumes that the longitudinal acceleration is constant. Moreover, it starts accelerating the vehicle from a standing start until it hits a maximum speed, then it decelerates it until it stops. For the vehicle, we assume that there is no clutch modulation. To deal with the launch, we use the method described in part 3 of the series, where we talked about the vehicle model. Also, as this is a point mass system, there is no longitudinal weight transfer during this simulation. Although, if someone wanted to add the bicycle model into Open Lab, I think that Open Drag is the best place to start actually experimenting with this stuff, if you want to learn. As far as the road surface is concerned, the grip is the same everywhere, with the grip factor being equal to 1. Finally, banking is 0 and the inclination can be defined as a constant value. Now let's go through the gear shifting procedure. First, we check if at the current state the engine RPM is more than the shift point RPM. If it is not, then we just allow the vehicle to continue accelerating. If it is, then we have either hit the rev limiter or there is more acceleration potential to be found by going one gear higher. At this point, we need to check if we are currently at the highest gear. If we are, then we inevitably have to stop as the engine will not allow us to go faster. If we have higher gears to shift to, we initiate a gear change. During a gear shift, the vehicle will be decelerated by a small amount due to the drag forces. Also, we have to wait for the specified delay to simulate the gear engagement time. When the gear is engaged, then we can continue accelerating again. Now let's see what happens when we don't have enough power to hit the engine speed limiter at the end of the simulation. What I mean by that is that the vehicle has a gearing setting that will allow it to go faster, but the tractive force that it can generate is less than the total drag force. What happens in this situation is that the limit of the velocity when the time approaches infinity is equal to the maximum drag velocity. At the same time, as time approaches infinity, the longitudinal acceleration approaches zero. This creates a problem though. And the problem is that as we decrease the time step to increase our accuracy, the solver needs more and more and more time to see that the velocity does not change or that the acceleration has reached zero. The way we cope with this problem is by accepting a small value of the longitudinal acceleration as our new zero value, effectively moving the red dotted line upwards by a small amount. Programmatically, this is done by checking if the longitudinal acceleration has become smaller than the sensitivity we have set in the simulation settings. If it has, then we stop the simulation. Now let's go through the code structure. Open drag structure can be seen in this diagram. The code starts by reading the specified vehicle model. Then it reads the user settings. After, it calculates all the forces that remain constant throughout the simulation. Then it pre-allocates some memory for the solution. And finally, to finish the initialization stage, it sets the boundary conditions that are true for the acceleration sequence. With initialization complete, it starts accelerating the vehicle. 
While accelerating, it checks if the vehicle has hit the RPM limiter or shift point, if the pre-allocated memory is full, and if the vehicle is drag limited. If all these check out fine, then it checks for speed traps, updates the forces and the RPM, and goes on to the gear shift check. After, it calculates the needed throttle position to not overload the tires, calculates the final longitudinal acceleration, and uses the equation of motion to calculate the next state. This new state now becomes the previous state and the loop continues. When we have hit top speed and there is more memory left, the code starts the deceleration procedure. Again, it checks if the car has stopped or if the memory is out. Then it looks at the same speed traps, updates the forces, the gear shifts, the RPM, the longitudinal acceleration and the brake pressure sensor. Then it uses again the equations of motion to compute the next vehicle state. When the vehicle has stopped, the simulation is completed. Let's now look at the code itself. First we clear the memory. Then we start the total simulation timer. After we declare the file name that includes our vehicle model. And then we go into the settings. And here we set if we want to use the date and time in the simulation results file name. What our time step is. What our maximum allowed time for the simulation is for our memory pre-allocation. Our longitudinal acceleration sensitivity for drag limitations and then come the speed traps. With this speed trap variable, you can set specific speed values for which you get reports for the needed time and distance that the vehicle needs to reach them. Then we set banking to zero and the constant inclination angle. With this done, we now start pre-processing our data. We load the vehicle file, we get the mass, the gravitational acceleration, the longitudinal tire variables, we calculate the normal load on all the tires, the induced lateral and longitudinal weight. Obviously, the induced lateral weight is going to be zero because our banking is zero. We save our ratios, the tire radius, our drivetrain efficiencies. We save the RPM curve and the torque curve from the engine. And we also save the shift points. When I say save, I mean save the values to variables with different names that we can easily use in the future. Here, we pre-allocate the memory for all our variables for our solutions. We set the initial time to zero, the initial distance to zero, we zero the initial velocity and the initial acceleration, we set the gear to one and the previous gear to one, we set the shifting condition to false so that the code doesn't check for a shifting condition when it actually starts, the RPM we set it to zero, we set the throttle position to zero and the brake to zero, we initiate the traps and we tell the code to check for trap number one in the beginning and then we set our iteration number to one. Here we just update the heads up display, create the folder that will contain our simulation results, add the date and time in the simulation name if we have set the use date and time in name variable to true, delete the previous log file and create a new one. Now we start the acceleration simulation. First we initiate the timer. Then we start an infinite while loop. This loop starts by saving the current vehicle state in memory and then it checks if the vehicle's velocity has surpassed the maximum allowed by the engine limiter velocity. If it has, we break the loop. We then check if we are out of memory. If we are, we break the loop. Then comes the drag limitation check. If we are at full throttle and our total acceleration is under our sensitivity value, then we are drag limited and we break the loop. We need to include this TPS equals to one check here just to make sure that the loop doesn't break for other reasons like when you are in a gear shift where the longitudinal acceleration is going to be negative and it's for sure under the sensitivity value. Then we move on to the speed trap checks. If the speed trap check flag is true, then we actually initiate a check. If the flag is true, we check if the speed is higher than the current speed trap value that the index points us to. If it is, we have activated the trap. So we increase the trap index by one and check if we have hit all of the traps. If we have, we deactivate the speed trap check flag. With this now completed, we recalculate our aero forces, the new rolling resistance, the load on the driven wheels, and the total negative acceleration caused by the drag forces. Then we calculate the current RPM. To do that, we need to check if we are actually in gear zero, which is actually neutral, which means that we are actually in the gear shifting procedure. If we are, we get our RPM values using our previous gear, and if the gear change is finished, then we use the current gear to do it. Then we proceed to the actual gear shifts. 
we first check if we have surpassed the shift point and that we are not currently shifting gears. If this is true, we have to check if we are currently in the highest gear. If we are, then we cannot upshift, so we need to break the loop. If we have more gears to go, then we initiate a gear shift. We do this by setting the gear shifting flag to true, saving the current time value, zeroing the longitudinal acceleration from the engine, updating our previous gear variable, and setting our current gear to zero or neutral. This takes care of the first if statement. Now we go on to the first else if statement. This includes the check of the gear shifting flag. If this flag is true, it means that all the conditions for a gear shift were met at some point in the past, but we are still waiting for the delay to pass. So if we are in this condition, we zero the engine tractive acceleration, and then we check if the time delay has passed. If it has, we set the shifting flag to false, and we update the current gear to the previous one plus one. Now we are done with the second else if statement, and we move on to the final else statement. Here we just accelerate. We get the maximum allowed by the tire's longitudinal acceleration. Then we get the current engine torque output by interpolating the curve at the current RPM value. We calculate the wheel torque. And then the power limited longitudinal acceleration. Finally, we choose the minimum value between the tire and the engine accelerations to complete this if statement. So to sum up, we first check if we need to shift, and if yes, if we have more gears. We also check if we are currently in a gear shift. And then, if all of these are false, we just calculate the allowed acceleration. With the acceleration now known, we calculate the throttle position, the new total longitudinal acceleration by taking into account drag, and then we use the equations of motion for constant acceleration during the time step to get the next position, the next velocity, we update the time, and we update the index for our next iteration. And this takes care of the acceleration. When the loop is broken, we save the index for later use if needed. We calculate the average speed and stop the acceleration timer. Now we start the deceleration sequence. We start the deceleration timer just like before. We save the starting time and the current position. We enable the speed track check flag. And we get the next available speed trap value that is lower than the current speed. Then we update the heads up display. And just like before, we initiate an infinite while loop. In this loop, we save the current vehicle state, and we check if we have stopped, or if we are out of memory. If these two are true, then we just break the loop. Then we check the speed traps in the same exact manner as before, with the only difference now being that we have to check if the speed is less or equal than the speed trap value. Then we calculate our aero forces, our rolling resistance, our drag deceleration, our current gear, which we get by using the drivetrain model directly from open vehicle as we do not need to incorporate gear shifting delays anymore. And after we do the same for the RPM, get the maximum available tire deceleration. We set that acceleration as our command. We calculate the brake pressure needed and then the final longitudinal acceleration. And again, with the equations of motion, we calculate the new step, the new velocity, the new time, and the next iteration. This takes care of the braking loop. When this loop is broken, we calculate the average deceleration and we stop the deceleration timer. Then we update the heads up display and we stop the total timer and we delete the empty rows that are left from the memory pre-allocation in the beginning. Then we save our simulation results and we stop the log file. Then we plot our results with these commands here. And we save the figure. Now if we run the script, we see the results displayed versus time on the left column and versus distance on the right column. We can also take a look at the log file. This log file includes a table with all the shift points, the speed traps and the performance of the vehicle in general. Here we can see that the generic F1 car that I used to run the simulation has reached a top speed of 316.28 km per hour in 22 seconds and after 1607 meters with an average acceleration of 0.4 g and a peak acceleration of 1.65 g. Obviously, the, the average acceleration and the time and the distance to actually hit the drag limited speed are all affected by our acceleration sensitivity and by our time step. Then it breaks from this maximum speed to zero in 85 meters, which is the relative value for the velocity, and 2.52 seconds 
with an average deceleration of 3.55 g and a peak deceleration of 5.8. Obviously, this peak deceleration number is quite high, but it has to do with how I have defined my tire. So this just shows me that I should probably reduce the longitudinal friction coefficient of my tires. And that's it for today. At this point, we have gone through everything we need, and we can finally take a look at the full lap time simulation procedure. But that's the topic of the next video. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them below. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next time.